It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tim Jeanette. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette, the Mental Meeple, and in this video we're taking a look at Luxor by Queen Games, published in 2018. It's by designer Rudiger Dorn, and uh, the artist is Dennis Lohazen. I really apologize if I butcher those names. This is for two to four players and takes about 45 minutes or so to play. And basically it's a game where your adventurers are rushing around this spiral of a tomb to collect points along the way and to get to the center. The first two adventurers to the center will actually get some bonus points. And at that point, you're going to do a bunch of in-game scoring. And whoever has the most points is the winner. The interesting part about it is the hand management and the fact that you're always going to only play the far left and right card of the five card hand that you have. Uh, it might be easier if I show you how it plays. So let's take a look and we'll come back and tell you what I think. So here we have Luxor in its full setup with four players. You're basically going to take two adventurers per player, start them at the entrance, and then each player uh, is going to put one of their other adventurers face down on these three spots here. All these tiles that are along here are pretty much randomly generated, except there are a couple of spots, like for instance these uh, red tiles here do have certain spaces that they go in. These yellow tiles are pretty much exactly what's printed here, but otherwise all these tiles around here are randomly set up and drawn and placed on these spaces here. All this stuff off to the left is kind of set up the way uh, the book describes it. You've just got these piles off to the side and a bunch of the tokens and stuff as you can gather them or whatnot. So the idea of the game is to move your pieces deeper into this tomb until you get to the center, which is where the, uh, where the I guess the Pharaoh is, and you want to take the sarcophagi. And the game is going to end whenever both of these are taken. Now, one player can take both or, you know, basically the first two meeples or adventurers to get to the center are going to claim these. The first will get the five, the second will get the three, and at the end of the game round, the game will end. So the game could go a lot shorter uh, if people just race to the end, but obviously you want to kind of get a lot of your adventurers as close to the center as possible because you're going to be gathering points as you go along. Now, each player is going to receive a hand of five cards from this draw uh, stack here. And these cards are not going to be rearranged in your hand ever. So you're always going to keep your cards like this. The reason for this is because on your turn, you're going to choose either the leftmost card or the rightmost card and perform a move with one of your adventurers. In this case, we have a one and a one. So we can move one dude, one space. So let's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit here, kind of give you a little bit more idea of what's going on. Let's say we wanted to play this card here. We would first discard it into the pile, and I would choose one of my adventurers to move one space. In this case, we'll move this guy here, and then it would be the next player's turn. So they, uh, at the end of my turn, though, I would also draw a card and place it in the middle. And so you can see as you spin cards, and cards go in the middle, it's going to start rotating or uh, taking the actions and separating them to the ends and then you're always going to have at least two options. So you can kind of plan ahead. So I know if I play this card then I'm going to be able to play the three the following round. So say it comes back to me and I play this one. On your turn you're going to play a card, do a move, and then perform an action if you can. In this case if we move here you can see that the requirement to take this tile is two adventurers of the same person, so which I do have now. So I would claim this, I would immediately score three points and keep this statue in my stash because at the end of the game it's going to be used in set collection purposes. So I'd move my piece up here for three and these adventurers would simply go in this blank space. Now the next player to move is going to ignore blank spaces, so if, say green's next they're gonna, and they move three, they would actually skip this spot, go one, two, and three. Now, when tiles are taken, such as this one for instance, sometimes they're going to reveal a symbol behind it, and there are stacks of tiles off to the side, in which case you're going to draw one in place on top of it. In this case, we have these eyeballs of Horus here, and if somebody goes here, they can draw one of the cards off to the side. So off to the side on this board over here, we have uh, a stack of, or three stacks of cards, 
And these are basically better movement cards. You can see one, two, and three, and you're always gonna be able to see the top card. So in this case, if we were to draw this, because we can pick one or two, so we can draw the top card of one of these two stacks, then we're gonna get one of these cards. This card will allow us later, when we spend it as a move, to move one space with all of our adventurers in, in, in the uh, tomb. So this is a pretty cool card. What's interesting about these cards, though, is you get them, but and, and they go in the center of your hand. Like, you know, say you had four cards, this would go in the center of your hand. So as you play cards, this will be filtered out to the edge. When you play these special cards here, they're actually going to go in the same discard pile. And so this is going to be shuffled later on, and then everybody can start drawing those cards from, from then on. And so the game's going to keep going. You're going to play a card. You're going to move an adventurer. You're going to see if you can do the action on that space. So let's show you a couple more actions here. This one will allow you to choose one of the, uh, uh, the top card on the, the two eyeball deck, or you can take a key. Keys are, are pretty important. They're only worth one victory point at the end of the game. However, you need a key in order to enter the final chamber here and take one of the bonus sarcophagi. Uh, or even just to enter the, the final room because you do get points based on which space you're on at the end of the game. Uh, another action here, let's see, would be these red flags here. When you land on it, you simply say you move three spaces and this is the last space you land on, it will kick you another two spaces out. That's all these do. You can see some of these uh, tiles here to collect the pots and stuff that require one, two, or three guys. And again, once you fill it up, you're going to get that many points. And let's see, there's one here. Let's go to the special tiles, I think. In here, there's going to be a, uh, like a teleporter. One of them will do nothing. They're going to come up on the board when one of these tiles have been purchased, such as this one right here. And then if you go there, it's going to teleport you to the next one. In this case, there isn't a one, so it's not going to do much. But if one popped up over here, then you can see you can jump pretty far into the dun uh, into the uh, the tomb. This right here is going to give you a wild token. It's worth zero points, but it is used for wilds for set collection, which we'll get into in just a second. And then finally, we have these scarabs. These scarabs are kind of shuffled off to the side, and when you draw one of these, they are just worth a random amount of points. This one's one. This one's three. So you just get a random amount of points. Like I said, the game is going to continue until the uh, two meeples have reached the center and taken these two sarcophagi, and then you're going to move on to final scoring. The first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get points for each adventurer on the space they're at. And you can see here that if you're on this space, they would wor be worth one point because the scarab's up here. But if you're on this space, it would be worth zero. Typically, though, as you go further in to the tomb, they're going to be worth more and more. The final tomb is worth 13, and you can see the ones beside it, this one's worth 11. The second thing you're going to get is the bonus points for being, you know, first and second person to reach the center, because uh, you would have claimed these tokens. You're going to get one point for every key that you have left over, and then you've got the, um, the, the set collection. There are three pieces to a set. You have the, this would be one set. You've got the necklace or the jewelry, the pottery, and the statue. Now, if you only had two of these, you could use one of these pieces here as a wild. You can see how it has all three of the symbols. This would be one set. Now, depending on how many sets you have, you're going to score this many bonus points. And then finally, however many scarabs, you're going to flip them over and score as many points on the back of those cards as well. And just to show you a couple more things, like with the movement cards here, you can see like uh, this one is like a catch-up card. Your guy that's farthest behind will catch up to the next farthest guy. Uh, that's pretty cool. This one was is a two move, but it's going to lower the requirement. So in this case, if you wanted to gather, um, let me find one here. If this three-pointer and you played this card, you would only need two guys. So if you had one on there, you can move another guy for two on here and claim this tile. And then this one's just a one through six. And it is worth noting that in the base deck, there are a couple of them that use this red die. Uh, this one would simply just be roll the die and whatever number it is, that's a four. This would just become a four move. And I think some of them maybe in this deck here have a number dash the die. Here it is. So if I would have rolled this four, this would be one to four spaces. 
So there's a few more rules, but for the most part, this should give you an idea of the game. You're basically trying to race as far into the tomb as possible, gather as much treasure as possible, collect the right treasures to get the right sets and stuff, and then get to the center as fast as possible. And, you know, you're kind of judging based on what other players are doing. If you're trying to rush to the end, you don't want to try to keep all your guys near the beginning and try to collect all these because you can see there's a lot of points to be gained just by the space that you're on at the end. So let's go back and talk about what I think of the game. And there you go. That is Luxor by Queen Games. As a disclaimer, I did receive this as a review copy from the publisher. So keep that in mind as we talk about what we're, what we're about ready to say. Uh, I'm just going to say it, this game is amazing. I really, at the first play, I told uh, Travis, who works for uh, Queen Games, I was like, this game is phenomenal. As a gateway game, this is just up there, right? Everything about it is really cool. I like the, the hand management of it. I think that kind of, it almost replaces the roll and move mechanism of the past, right? Even though you don't roll the die very often, it you know happens every once in a while on a certain cards, but it's just the idea of you know moving around this board kind of like Monopoly style, even though you're kind of doing this spiral, but you're playing these cards and you kind of can plan, uh, you can plan a couple of moves ahead because as the cards f fade out to the outsides of your hand, you're like, well, I can play this now that I'm gonna have a three, so you're already planning your next move, but by the time you're planning your next move, it's almost your turn again. The turns are super fast. Uh, it's not like you're doing a whole lot in your turn. You just move a guy and do the space that he's on. And then it's the next player's turn and it just keeps the flow just goes and goes and goes. I really enjoy that. Even those special cards that you can get that are a little bit better movement cards. They're not that much better. And it's neat that they go in the discard pile and everybody else can kind of draw those. Some people may not think that's neat, but I think it actually works out really well for this game. Uh, based on what type of game it is, like gateway style. I think that's pretty neat. Um, I also like the set collection aspect of it. You know, you're collecting points as you go along, but then the set collection forces you to want to diversify. You know, otherwise it's just really taking the biggest points. But you're like, well, this one's worth eight, but this one's worth four, and I need a necklace, you know, so you want to go after that one. And it, it kind of makes players, uh, it just works out really well, I think. And I love games with set collections, so that kind of helps there too. Uh, I th overall, I think this is a great gateway game. Um, I like the um, the scoring actually at the end where the different spaces have points. I feel like that projects the game into a, um, you want to move as far as possible with all your guys, not just one dude. It's not a race to the end. It kind of is, but it's not because you want to collect things along the way and you get rewarded for that too because you've got deeper into the, um, deeper into the tomb. And, you know, whether the, those tiles are all randomized, so that's not really what's... The score doesn't diversify that much among those, but, you know, the, the deeper you get, the more points you get for the space you're on. I think that's really cool, and I love games that have all these layers of scoring. And this one has quite a bit. I love the, the scarabs, how you can pick those up and they're kind of random. I typically stay away from them because I'm not good at drawing, uh, like, the higher point ones. So... Uh, I, I choose other methods, but I think it's a neat strategy, and I love games that have that that kind of hidden draw in them. I, I just, it's really good. I, I know this game just got nominated for the Spiel des Jahres. I uh, probably butchered that, but um, and I'm really glad because uh, a couple months ago when I first played this, I was like, this game is phenomenal, and I was worried that it wouldn't get as much credit, uh, maybe because you know just various factors. But it looks like it is. I'm very excited for it. I hope it wins, uh, and I just. I think the game is great, and if you haven't got a chance to try it, I highly recommend you try this one, even if it doesn't seem like it's your cup of tea because it's a gateway game. It is really fun, especially if you play it with people who aren't really, you know, into board gaming or they're looking to get into board gaming. This is probably the one I'm going to bust out for most of that case, uh, most of those cases. So, if you have any questions or comments, please comment below or email me at timjanet at gmail.com. Follow me on social media at the handle below. Check out my podcast called MeepleCore. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.